you if you still owe me money. <laughs> that is for your lunch tomorrow and your teas and coffees. So if you don't pay me, I will be subsidizing you. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, welcome. I'm glad we're all here. I think we better get moving. Um, our first speaker is Skulk Dormiel. Is that how you pronounce it, Skulk? Close enough. Or Dormiel. Oh, you made it. Um, yeah. Skulk is going to talk on smart contracts and prediction markets. And he is, in fact, running a little prediction market on the Lipsa page. You can find it on the Lipsa posts on the outcome of who will win the best speech here. And so far, I think he and I are the only ones who place the bet. So please, we get on and place your bets. So it's not just between the two of us. Noon on Sunday morning. You can. First on Sunday morning. I'll explain how the whole, I'll explain how the whole thing works, basically. It's quite dynamic, so you've got a lot of options. Oh, okay. So I'll scalp them. For, for an introductory, few introductory notes, and he sent me a very long thing about smart contracts and prediction markets, which I couldn't really understand. So I said, I'd like something personal, please. So these are his personal notes. Software developer, early stage cryptocurrency and consensus network invents Vesta. <laughs> Those are the personal notes of a libertarian. <laughs> please welcome Skull. Those personal notes originally they also contain as attempted to read Agnes Schreck. <laughs> okay, hi. Um, it's like I'm, I'm glad there's a lot more people here than there was 10 minutes ago. I was a little worried that my uh, death defying drive yesterday night may have been for nothing. Uh, so yeah, so today I'd like to speak to you on uh, smart contracts, distributed autonomous organizations, that's what that acronym is for, and prediction markets, right? Um, I'd just like to make a little note that many bottoms died to bring you this information, for those of you who are Star Wars fans. Um, I really, like yesterday, a lot of things just randomly went wrong. My one boss, I think, would have threatened me with, the, with my employment, the ad up in his direct underling. And my other boss told me, you know, to basically go that guy and to take the leave that I put in because the guy's in the wrong, etc., etc. So um, I'm here under quite a bit of trepidation. I'm extremely tired. I went to bed at like two o'clock yesterday night, and I had quite a hectic drive here, almost committing, I don't know, antelope aside or whatever you call it, on a couple of those really cute little things next to the road. All right, so let's kick off. Ah. <laughs> All right, okay, so there's so much for my technical expertise there. All right, <clears throat> so, okay. Oh, there we go. Um, okay, so you can really like ignore probably most of this. This is largely for my own edification, just so that I have some, uh, some notes to refer to. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, like I said, what I like to speak about is smart contracts, and um, I think let's just review, and um, guys, I really like want some interaction from you as well. Um, I've prepared about uh, 30 minutes worth of, um, of like actual talk, and, and the rest I really want to be like um, more of a Q&A session. Um, lots of this topic is stuff that, that I'm really immersed in, and, and that um, I spend a lot of time thinking about reading or, or somehow like experimenting with. So um, I think I take for granted that some of the building blocks to actually get to, to that point of understanding might not be obvious, right? So I'm going to try and cover some of them during this talk. If I don't, please feel free to stop me and actually like ask me, listen, what does that thing mean that you just said? All right, so with contracts, basically, I mean, um, I'm not a lawyer at all, but um, you know, I've, I've always had this personal motto that trust is ultimately the only currency. Right, that, that contracts are really only there for us to agree on what we've agreed upon. Right, I think generally speaking, for all of you who've ever been in a contract dispute, normally by the time things have gotten to that point, you've already suffered a loss. Right, things have already gone sideways. Trying to force the other guy at that point to really like keep up his end of the bargain, um, you know, at least in my experience, lots of the times doesn't pan out the way that you wanted the original thing to pan out. 
The second thing is it serves as a reminder. I mean, if you enter into a contract, if you enter into some sort of a formalized agreement, it does sort of like, at least for honest people, act as a reminder for what they were actually involved in and why they were involved in that thing to start off with. But again, the assumption is that, uh, again, it's for reasonable people. It's not necessarily for unreasonable people. All right, um, <clears throat> contracts, generally speaking, can hold consequences. So. Um, there might be the requirement that we bond ourselves into a contract, you know, we might have to put up surety of some sort, and we default on that surety if that doesn't uh, pan out. Alternatively, we may face legal consequences. Now, legal consequences really only have any teeth if ultimately there's force behind them. Right? And most of us here have had enormous debates on the nature of force and, and where we should use force and where we shouldn't use force. Right, and, um, and lots of contracts uh, you know, ultimately, especially when people get unhappy or when the contract actually needs to be brought to the fore again and, and reviewed and, and, you know, and, and people need to be nipple twisted um, to actually like it, we typically like rely on mistakes. Um, <clears throat> so, so some of the feedback that I got for preparation on this thing was there, there's a big debate amongst libertarians as to whether or not law can be privately produced and how it would typically be produced, right? And, and I hope to address some of that through actual examples of things that have happened recently. All right, so <clears throat> smart contract, right? So can law be privately produced? Um, let's just get a quick, quick few opinions. I'm sure there aren't only anarcho-capitalists. I'm sure there, there's a wide variety of people here. Can law be privately produced if we don't have a monopoly on violence? It's like a quick feel from the crowd. Okay, let's, let's start at the back there. Um, I, I say this with hesitation with Gavin sitting in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> According to high laws, not privately produced. It arises like the market out of uh, essentially uh, uh, interactions between people. Okay. It is it's not privately produced. So you say that law is emergent. It is an emergent phenomenon, like language and like prices. Yes. Okay. Yes, yeah. Well, the issue really is that people can quite easily privately make arrangements, mm -hmm. and uh, most people do. The law is normally there when people forget to agree about a certain point, and then that becomes an argument later on, and the law normally provides a set of default provisions to preserve peace in society. A good way also to do smart enforcement is people can give the security to an independent third holder, mm -hmm. and if anybody produces no coercion is necessary, of course the third party innocent broker or holder then gives it to the party in default, who's not in default. So you don't even have to have coercive enforcement. But the purpose of having a state or a set of rules is when people muck up. They don't agree properly up front. They don't expressly agree smartly. And by the way, I'm assuming it's not the contracts have an IQ, it's that the people have an IQ in using their arrangements, isn't it? Uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. And the, I think the basic problem is people sometimes fail with their IQ. They forget to agree something. The Romans had this notion that a good person dies with the will, or that good people agree expressly what their provisions are. But 90% of the time, people don't agree on some important issue, and then the law provides an implied term, uh, uh, which okay, is then so coercively implemented so that people can uh, not end up like hillbilly shooting each other. Okay. Right. So, sorry, so is that a yes or a no on private? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is maybe 90% of the time, but you need a fail safe for coercion. So, fail safe for coercion, okay. Okay, so the question is whether we can do that in the absence of a state. So, what I'm hearing is. <laughs> Generally, it's the state, but there's also the possibility of doing it through a society or some other mechanism, not necessarily the state. Or not only the state. Or not only the state. Okay, and then do you think that would, that would work? Especially if we, if we took the fail-safe, as Gavin was talking about, it's possible to reduce the fail-safe without the state. I, I understand the point that, so the short answer, yes. I think it's possible. My, my feeling is that I agree that 90% of the time there might be something missed, or 10% of the time, whatever that percentage is, is irrelevant. Um, you need some law to say, in the case where people forget clause, this particular clause out of the contract, this is how our society deals with it. Putting that in the hands of the state, no. Okay. All right. So you say that the people that, that in jurisdictions they can compete. There should be people. another mechanism of okay. doing that other than this. All right. Okay. Um, next quick question. Sorry if I don't get to everyone. Um, just on the question of violence, actually, right? So in other words, we're talking about this fail-safe. Now, let's say we have two truly disagreeing bodies. They're both completely convinced that they are right. 
Is it possible then, um, especially when there's like a limited resource or a property dispute of some sort, that we could maybe sort this out without the use of violence? That we could actually build the failsafe without having to resort to violence? What do you guys think? Just, just actually, personally, I don't have an opinion. We'd have to see. We'd have to build in that direction and see if we can. If you are smart, that. yes. If you are not smart, no. Anyone else? But if if one of the parties is a pacifist, the other party gets his way, right? That's that's a, a way of solving the problem. It just doesn't always help the pacifists. Uh, okay, so in other words, if the pacifist is willing to sacrifice some of his property for his beliefs, yeah. then, then at least in those cases, then society would remain relatively peaceful. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I don't know. I've I've seen some mothers guilt trip their kids into stuff. Sorry, guys. I know we're all libertarians and we all want answer that right quick. And I realize that I sort of like have just baited you here with <laughs> with crack cocaine for libertarians. So sorry, I'm not going to get to everyone's shop. Insurance. Yeah. Insurance, you take out insurance. That's a very good idea. So in other words, with insurance, we could possibly actually get, a rid, get rid of lots of the violence. So we could like, let, let, let's just take a scenario there for instance. Let's say in terms of like some sort of a property dispute, we might have a society that is massively insured and that says that listen here, if some dispute like arises at that point, the insurance kicks in and we actually say that listen here, we're going to flip a coin, one of you is going to get the property, the other is going to get the money, you know, but we're not going to resort to violence, you know, it's not 2015 anymore, we're not sad this. Okay, so that, that's a possibility. Okay, you really want to say something, <laughs> Trevor, let's go. If, if you believe that spontaneous markets can settle and uh, differences and grow without violence, then you really ought to believe that the spontaneous development of law can settle and grow without violence. Okay, okay, that's, that's a good point. Okay, so let, let's take a let's take an example of something that's actually going on at the moment, or well, something that did happen, and that was the Silk Road. Now, guys, if you haven't read the case of the Silk Road, you you need to like, I mean, just purely from an entertainment standpoint, you need to go read up on what, what happened there. Uh, this guy called Ross Ulbricht um, started. Uh, um, uh, well, no, he did. Well, he eventually admitted to starting it, so it's no longer a legend. He did admit to starting it. He started a uh, what is called a dark market. So it's basically a website that runs behind a service called Tor, which basically anonymizes uh, you from people like uh, the CIA and the, probably, maybe not the NSA, but the vast majority of intelligence agencies can't actually see who you are, right? And um, he started this market, and he was a very um, principled anarcho-capitalist, and uh, and he actually like used the handle the Dread Pirate Roberts, which is from a movie. Um, uh, the Princess Bride, also very, very cool. If you want to watch that, you'll really see the ethos of what he was aiming for. But he basically had these very long um, <clears throat> like blog posts and, and things on the site about how they are taking violence out of, you know, um, specifically the drug market. Now, what's interesting is that thing was incredibly functional, <clears throat> right? So one of their major premises was that they're taking the concept, the, the opportunity of violence off the table completely. There is no one to hit anyone else because you don't know who anyone is. What he did from his side was he actually acted as an escrow agent um, so that if there was a dispute, they could actually then sort it out with the different suppliers. Um, even outside of those, disputes were actually incredibly limited as well. And market forces just kicked in and these drug dealers who previously were talking smack and all kinds of things on the street corner probably, you know, became real like um, <clears throat> incredibly high quality suppliers. You know, with an incredible, um, I would say nearly unparalleled, like customer focus on really trying to help their customers out. Now, the Silk Road was built on all this non-violence and all this kind of stuff, but unfortunately, what happened eventually was um, part of this drama is that a bunch of federal agents really like corrupt, that they actually like took over parts of the site. They, they literally stole bitcoins and tried to hide them from the FBI who they were working with. It really, it, there's going to be a movie and it's going to be phenomenal. I mean, the, the stuff that's coming out specifically on the corruption of the FBI, is it, it's crazy. One of the things that the FBI agents actually did was um, they, uh, they eventually turned one of his system administrators and uh, because they had control of the site, they stole some of the bitcoins and then they pretended to say that, listen, you know, we can, I'm an assassin and I can go kill this guy if need be. Now, Ross Ulbricht at this point, basically, um, he was faced with the option of either A, having their database turned over and um, I'm not sure how many registered users there were, I think there were a couple of hundred thousand registered users, having all these people's identities exposed, um, you know, really like having a large amount of people thrown into rape cages. And, and from his perspective at that point, he reasoned that, listen, this guy has painted me into a corner and I'm going to pay for his assassination. 
Right, so that's one of the things that, that's somewhat disputed as to whether or not it really happened. But even this incredibly principled guy, you know, sort of like ended up eventually, as far as we can see, um, at, even if it was in anguish, organizing a hit on someone. Now, as far as we can tell, nobody ever, ever actually died. The FBI just staged a photo of a, you know, this guy under a bag with his hand sticking out, effectively. Right, but that's an example of how I think there was something like, I don't want to lie, I think there was something like 1.1 million successful drug dealers done peacefully over this market. I mean, and, and whatever your, your feeling or anything is about illicit drugs, I mean, that is a phenomenal accomplishment. It is a phenomenal accomplishment how much business that site actually ran through. Um, any questions? Sorry, okay, yeah, sorry, sorry, okay, sorry, sorry, okay, where am I now for time? Sorry guys, like I said, I'm a little tired, so my, my timing might be off as well. We've got another 45 minutes. Okay, cool, I'll, I'll speed it up then. All right, so the thing about the, uh, the Silk Road, for instance, was uh, that it's an escrow service. The problem there was it was still a third party. Right, and the problem with those types of escrow services for these dark markets is we saw after the Silk Road uh, collapsed that there was a set of other dark markets and what they typically did was they actually waited until they gained a large amount of clients who had on deposit a large amount of Bitcoins with them and then eventually they would steal the Bitcoins and they would run off. Right, so their, their promises of future earnings and the threat of possibly being imprisoned for this activity versus the amount of Bitcoins they actually had in their account. Eventually the amount of Bitcoins outweighed you know, that and they made the praxeological decision to run off with the Bitcoins. And that happened repeatedly after the Silk Road was shut down. So the thing is, a smart contract, just to quickly like talk about that, I mean, um, a smart contract sort of like sounds like a uh, a advert marketing employee from a um, from a legal firm. Uh, it doesn't really have to do with the people who engage in the contract are smart. It has to do with the settlement and execution mechanisms of the contract is automated. So in other words, the contract has certain aspects to it, and those things are typically programmatically defined. Then I'll get to how that is actually done, um, and their execution happens without third, without a trusted third party. Now that is an enormous jump forward. And I mean, this is not science fiction I'm talking about, this is happening right now. That is an enormous jump forward for humanity. That we can now actually interact with people that we haven't even met yet through contracts that we know mathematically will execute through a certain, um, yeah, you know, through a certain set of rules that we could identify before we entered into the contract. Okay, so an example, <clears throat> a very simple smart contract would be an escrow contract. Right, so they have these things on Bitcoin um, called multiple signature uh, transactions, right? And what that basically does is, let's say for instance, um, uh, Shurt there wants to, um, he wants to sell me, um, let's say he wants to sell me some high quality marijuana um, and uh, I, I need to pay, pay him through, through Bitcoin, right? So we can't really rely on, on the classical state um, to really like underpin our, our transaction here, right? Again, I'm, I'm not trying to say this or that about drug use, right? I'm just using it as an example for where we don't have access to normal contracts. Um, and he wants to, he, uh, I, I want to buy it from him, he wants to sell it to me, but the problem is I only know him by his handle, Nederlander uh, 95, you know, and I'm Haasboer 81, you know, and, um, and, and, and these two entities don't know if they can really trust each other. So what we could do on the Bitcoin, um, at least on the Bitcoin blockchain, is we could set up a special type of transaction that has three signatories on it, right? So you can think of it as sort of like a, um, you know, like a multiple signatory checking account, where if two of the three registered signatories agree that the transaction must continue, then it continues. Right, so we might appoint Colin there um, as our escrow agent, um, and then if we have any sort of a dispute with each other, right, if the transaction went through without flaw, then all that would happen is I would sign, he would sign, the money would move, and we're both happy, right? Then in 99% of the cases, that's actually what happens, right? In the 1% of the cases where that's not, then we contact our, um, our escrow agent, and we actually negotiate with him, and he eventually comes up with some compromise, and we say, okay, well, we move 80% of the money there, 20% of the money back goes back to Skulk, you know, he was just unhappy with the packaging, etc., etc. And that's kind of like how the thing then settles. But the amazing thing is, we don't have to trust each other for that thing to actually happen. Now, um, 
another example of, of a similar type of an escrow thing is, I mean, that is that is sort of like where we still need human interaction, right? And, and in this blockchain world, they call it, we need access to an oracle. It's just a fancy way of saying, we need a third human to give input into the smart contract, how it executes. One way we wouldn't even really need an oracle is for something like an internet name domain transfer. Right, so if, if we have a registered domain on one of these blockchains, and I want to buy it uh, from sure. Right, then what we could do is we could actually just both place, I could place the money into the contract and he could place the internet domain's access into the contract. Then the contract can evaluate both and see if it's to terms and actually then just execute it. But unless both enter, both won't exit. And if only one person enters it, eventually the contract will give it back. So that's one example of, um, of, a, of a smart contract. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I, Okay, I, I'm going to just quickly stop any questions at this point. Colin. So when you say smart, you mean <coughs> self-executing? That's what I mean. I mean self-executing. Yes. The third party intervent intervener then is the software supplier. It's not mm -hmm. self-executing, it's executing by the third party who provides the software solution. That's a very so good... It's not automatic. And then mm -hmm. it doesn't account for a fraudulent transaction like where it's been hacked. And then the people start hunting down who young proper a sweet mat, sweet breath is, and they start shooting him. And then you mm -hmm. still need coercive intervention by a state, perhaps. Okay. Um, as of 2009, what you said was 100% true. After 2009, that problem was solved, and I'll get to that. All right. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so um, I think let me, let me address that, that question quickly. Okay, so <clears throat> specific, okay, it's Gavin, right? Yep. Okay, so um, specifically Gavin's question goes to if somebody else had to write this software, you know, then can't they be manipulated to change the software? Right, so let's take an example, like Microsoft, for instance, I honestly believe that Microsoft is one of the great boons of society and they really like improve life drastically for everyone. Um, but the problem is basically that the NSA, um, you know, they're on record for actually having jailed CEOs of companies for other unrelated things because they were uncooperative in doing illegal searches and seizures. So, so it's a real problem. Um, Microsoft, for instance, was one of the companies who was very hard hit by the whole, as uh, Edward Snowden uh, reveals, where basically a lot of their back-end data, the NSA was just effectively milking and querying just the way they wanted. This is exactly that problem that Gavin is speaking about. How do we know that our service provider hasn't been compromised? Like, I mean, he, has, he might have financial incentives to be compromised, um, and even if he doesn't, if he's ethical, you know, uh, lots of these organizations, like we see with the FBI, they're not ethical. Or at least there's elements inside of them who are willing to do all kinds of crazy stuff to get the job done. Right? <clears throat> so, the way that, that we solve that specific problem is, is through consensus network, right? There's a technology called Bitcoin, um, and Bitcoin runs off of a thing called a blockchain, right? Now, I'm going to, um, I gave a previous talk about how the blockchain works exactly and so forth. But for simplification, if you guys want more information, I think we can speak about that a little bit after, after the, uh, the conference. Mm -hmm. But blockchains are effectively databases with nearly universally agreed upon content. They are databases where we figured out a technique to reach consensus on what should be in the database in such a way that it would require more computing power than we possess as a society today or have ever possessed in aggregate to change one of those transactions that happened, say, 20 minutes ago. It becomes incredibly difficult to actually change that stuff. All right now, Bitcoin was the first implementation of this. Since then, there's been a a heck of a lot of like different experimentations into these consensus databases, well, specifically called blockchains, right? Uh, <clears throat> Bitcoin is a, um, in Bitcoin's case, it's a blockchain that only has rules for transferring money. So typically, uh, the scenario I just sketched is, is almost as complicated as it gets in Bitcoin. You can go a little bit more complex, uh, but really its capacity is somewhat limited. Mm -hmm. Um, the guy who invented it was clearly, um, you know, he, I, I think he was clearly inspired by, um, by, by Hayek and by others for, um, <clears throat> you know, basically for what money is and what the nature of money should be. Um, yes, and, and the Bitcoin network has, has been running pretty much uncompromised since 2009. Um, the modern state rests on two pillars, the capacity to jail you or hurt you and the capacity to print money from nothing. This thing is stabbing at their heart. 
it literally it goes against inflation. It's, it's not well, it's still inflationary in the long term. It's non-inflationary, and we can see that through the code. And secondly, it's also got a lot of elements in it to, if you wanted to avoid taxation, it would really be a short jump to actually avoid taxation through this mechanism. And again, I'm going to say this thing has been running pretty much uninterrupted. There's been about two major interruptions, um, and, and we can talk about that afterwards, since 2009. The fact that, that, that the governments of the world have at all even allowed to entertain the concept of regulating this thing, is actually, I would say, a testament to the fact that there are still some sane people in governments. Because they had a look at this and they realized that there was no way that they are going to stop this. Now again, it's a little bit outside of the scope of my talk to mathematically prove why we reach consensus on these things. But what that means is once that software is written here, whoever can read it afterwards can validate that this is the contract that they want to be in. So it's voluntary. These smart contracts are all voluntary. None of them take your money all of them basically say, if you get involved, these are the rules. And because they are stored on these mechanisms, on these blockchains, <coughs> we know for a fact that they are not going to change. If we understood them correctly, they, they are stored in public sight on immutable storage mechanisms. We know that they will not change. But one of the questions yesterday from um, Stephen was regarding security. All right, um, yeah, um, so, so there's two aspects to that. The one thing is like, okay, I, I think I've covered that. This thing is not getting hacked. Somebody is not randomly just changing the rules to, to this thing. Yes, but, but it's important to point out that there's no provider. There's no, mm. this is Microsoft, this mm. is Apple, this is blockchain. Yeah. It's distributed, so there's code, but it doesn't run on anybody's, you can't hold anybody accountable. So even if there was a state, even yeah. if there was something to enforce, even if it was compromised, yeah. there would be nobody to enforce it on. It doesn't belong to anybody. Yeah. Uh, one of the major things, sorry, one of the major things about this is that it, like you said, the words like decentralized. Anyone can take a copy of this database, start it up again, and replay the thing up to its current state. And they can validate every step to make sure that that is the way that it ran out. If one entity somewhere who runs this um, decides to change the rules, and he makes additions to that database, then all the other people who have a copy of this will just reject incoming information from that database. He will just be pushed out of the thing. And he won't actually be able to participate in the rest of the consensus market. And this seems to me to be like one of the strongest, I want to call it a social phenomenon that I've ever seen. It, it really like, it, it is incredibly, incredibly rock solid secure, and there is no central body. There is no CEO of Bitcoin to go jail. That is why governments, in my opinion, have decided to tolerate it. Because they realize that they would look utterly, utterly foolish if they went after this thing. Yes? Uh, just, just for clarification, so mm -hmm. the database in this particular instance exists in multiple locations with people independent of each other who don't know about each other. So it's really impossible to corrupt it because you'd have to corrupt all of those other databases at the same time that you don't have access to. Is that, is that yeah, right? Right. Exactly. Exactly. I think that, that is on my next uh, on my next slide. Let me just quickly see here. All right. So <clears throat> basically, one way to think about these things is, um, but but yes, that's correct. You, you you'd have to corrupt all the copies, and all the copies or all the copies would have to agree that, to a change to the rules of how changes are made to this database. Is right. this only for creating currencies, or also for creating contracts and transactions? Okay. Um, so basically, what um, what happened was in, in 2009. Uh, this we don't really know who he was. This guy called Satoshi Nakamoto published a white paper, which anyone can do. But he also published a piece of code called Bitcoin, right? Um, and a fairly small, fairly elegantish uh, piece of code. I think it was about 10,000 lines initially. And it initially just described a database for recording transfers of money and for injecting money into the economy in an incredibly creative way. Um, and that's all that Bitcoin really does. Now, there's lots of talk for guys who want to expand Bitcoin into other things, but in the meanwhile, there's been a lot of research into this. It also hinged on solving a, a very difficult uh, computer science problem um, <clears throat> about specifically how do you maintain data when you have possibly malicious attackers on that data, right? How, how do you maintain data amongst a set of people? And this research has led to additional projects. And the one that I'm personally excited about the most is a thing called Ethereum. Right? Um, now, Ethereum is effectively it is the worldwide computer. It is a computer that if you give it a program, you can be guaranteed, absolutely guaranteed, that it will execute exactly as you wrote it. 
Right, so again, the, um, I, I, can, I can branch off into the technicalities of that, but, but it is a completely generic environment. But the question I've asked is this to create a currency, or could one also use it to create another transaction like a fitting contract for building a power station? Okay, uh, let me give you a few examples, right? So uh, let me talk about distributed autonomous organizations, and you'll see what's possible with these smart contract platforms, right? So uh, a distributed autonomous organization is basically an organization with no central control. Right. Um, these things typically come into being through somebody who receives some piece of information or, or some piece of code and actually starts running it. Right. So it's, a, it's sort of a sink or swim situation. We, we try these things, we throw them, some of them survive, some of them um, don't survive, some of them do absolutely phenomenally well. Right. Um, a very good example of one of these things is Bitcoin. If you think of Bitcoin, Bitcoin basically, um, it had a creator, but he created it in such a way that at this point not even he can make changes to it. Right, it is basically ossified. It's very difficult to make changes to Bitcoin. Right, um, there is no CEO of Bitcoin to jail. There might be people who, who interact with Bitcoin where there can be some manipulation place, but there's no central person. Right, um, these distributed autonomous organizations like Bitcoin, for instance, they have different constituencies. Like one of the constituencies in Bitcoin might be the holders of Bitcoin. So it's everyone who holds value in Bitcoin. But that creates for them a certain set of incentives um, to protect the system, to make sure that it's functioning. Um, Bitcoin has certain suppliers. So certain people need to run the software. And at this point, it's actually becoming a little bit expensive to run the software. Some of them need to actually like run it um, in data centers, right? And those data centers, the way that Bitcoin is set up, receive incentives, they receive fees, they receive new Bitcoins that are minted for the work that they do for the distributed autonomous organization. And they've obviously got clients. I mean, some of the clients might be people who just want to transfer money. A friend of mine is living in New York at the moment. Uh, there, there's a, about 15% disparity between the uh, South African Bitcoin price and the New York Bitcoin price. So what he's doing is he's swiping his credit card in the US for every purchase, and you're basically getting 15% discount on everything, um, you know, sort of like exploiting that arbitrage. People who live on um, immigration corridors can send money to each other. So those are typically the clients of distributed autonomous organizations. Right. Now, what becomes possible with a thing like Ethereum is that we can build, Ethereum is now basically a generic platform to, for us to build anything on top of. To give you an idea of something that's actually relatively simple versus some of the stuff that's getting built on Ethereum is something like a stock settlement contract. Right, so let's say for instance, um, Urania wanted to raise capital. Right, um, what they could do with Ethereum is they could actually say that, listen, we are going to issue, say, 100 million shares. Right, um, and those 100 million shares, we want to provide the holders of that with, with all the benefits that Bitcoin provides. So in other words, uh, they trade in pseudonyms, um, you know, they, <coughs> their financial privacy is protected, um, you know, but at the same time, we want to be able to do things like actually send out dividends to them, right? So let's say in a certain period, Rania decides to pay out a 1 billion rand dividend, so that would translate to about 10 rands to every share. This contract can then actually take that money and distribute it provably fairly to all the people who currently hold those shares. Right, so that's one example of something we can do. And that's actually like on the simplest scale of things. Does that answer your question? It's very simple, yeah. You've got about 20 minutes. I've got about 20 minutes left. All right, okay, so I need to start jumping forward a bit. Um, well, there's, there's, there's a whole lot of segment to this. Okay, so, um, so just another quick example I wanted of a distributed autonomous organization. Uh, one of the alternatives is a thing called Nubits. Um, so, so basically, Bitcoin's major problem is massive price fluctuations. You know, it's very difficult to do business in something that, that varies up and down by 5% in a day or 20% in a month, right? But that's, you sort of like want to get in and out of that as quickly as you possibly can. Now, somebody had a very interesting idea with this thing called Nubits, and basically what they did was they built one of these distributed autonomous organizations where you have two constituents. You have the ones using the money, and you have the people who administer the price of Nubits. The point of a new bit is to actually trade at exactly one dollar. Right, now from an economic standpoint, this blows my mind that they accomplished this and they accomplished this without massive like financial backing. Right, so they launched new bits and they started trading new bits. There's a second component to new bits <coughs> called new shares, which people hold. The reason for holding it is um, you gain fees based on new bits that actually trade. But what your responsibility is as a new shareholder is you have to report back on how much is a new bit actually trading for? 
you have to say if it's trading too high or too low. And then the contract that was written to manage new bits through fees automatically burn new bits if it sees that it is now undervalued. You know, in other words, there's too much supply, which puts a break both on the supply and on the velocity of money. And if it's overvalued, it actually like just inserts little new bits all over the show, which incentivizes people to start spending it. And you can look, go look at the price of a new bit. It is, like from an economic standpoint, absolutely fascinating. That thing trades at a dollar. Right, so that's that's one very interesting use of that and, and more than okay, right, so quick three minutes of question time. Yeah, man. Wouldn't it be easier just if the consensus of society decided to use gold coins like ounces and grams, where society is a distributed autonomous organization and you have gold which can't be hacked because you can win that and it always makes the same sense? Rather than using software. Does somebody else want to answer that? Well could you not make a new bit that tracks the value of gold exactly then? You could uh, make it, 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 it track has all the transferability of, it, mm -hmm. of a Bitcoin, but all the value of gold. Yeah. Um, the, the way that I got onto this, by the way, Gavin, is I read a book from a guy called Mike Maloney, um, investing in gold and silver, and it was an incredibly good like monetary history, at least for somebody who knows nothing about monetary history. Um, and it's also like how I became a libertarian was as a result of that book. And he describes the qualities of money and all that kind of stuff, and that ultimately the market <laughs> decides what is money, right? And I'm of the opinion, actually, that the market, specifically in South Africa, decided gold is not money. The market decided that, despite our, you know, obviously our, our affiliation to gold and that kind of stuff, the market actually decided that rands are better for a set of for a set of reasons. I agree with you that definitely it is ultimately society that runs these things. And if these things don't serve society, society will build other structures that does serve. Um, a primitive sort of a, a distributed autonomous organization might be a religion with a script. You know, um, it's basically they, they have their original like holy, uh, holy scripts and they try and stick to that as closely as possible. If they see another group who's violating that, they declare heretics, they might declare war. But that's sort of like how their distributed autonomous organization runs. And this is more a tool for us to reach consensus faster because we do live in 2015. Uh, one of the things like gold, for instance, is we want to be able to transfer gold. I want to be able to pay for Netflix without having to mail them physical gold. Now there's the argument that yes, I could put it with a bank that is fully backed, etc., etc., etc. But then the bank has all the accounting problems with an all bank. But in a certain sense, it's just mm -hmm. software to make sure the Reserve Bank doesn't put more money and create inflation and things like this. Because you can't hack the system, it's a rigid set of rules relating to money creation. But it's still nothing to do with contracts. Like, I want to build a power station, I want to hire somebody to um, maintain my swimming pool or my outsourced service yeah. department. And those contracts are still going to have incredible ambiguities that could lead to conflicts and this can't resolve that. So it's not smart contracts. Well, well the thing is, it's again, smart regulation again I'm, I'm not proposing an ultimate solution to contracts. I'm proposing a solution to many contracts. There's a scale, if I can put it this way. On, on the one side of the extreme, we have things that can be completely resolved electronically on the blockchain. So in other words, if we, um, there are for instance gambling sites that bet on the random numbers used to resolve a block on the blockchain. That's fully encapsulated. And that's on this side of the spectrum. Right, so that's a, if we enter into that gambling contract, we know that it for a fact will be that there is no outside influence. In sort of, yeah, in the middle ish, we have something that might contain, um, you know, a third party that needs to execute the escrow. A little bit further out, we have something like Nubits, where people need to report back on a price and they've got all kinds of conflicting incentives. And I agree with you, over here, there's contracts there's no enforcement for. There's, the, you know, we, we can't use these tools for that, but I'm not trying to prescribe a panacea for things. I'm just saying that a lot of the problems that we face, um, specifically with regards to money creation, with regards to insurance, with regards to um, issuing security for uh, you know, raising credit, that kind of a thing, are incredibly well addressed inside of this framework. Basically escrow contracts and value-dependent monetary issue contracts, the shares. Well, Colin, can you throw a few more examples? Well, it, it, it's it's any, any contract that can be described in code uh, with like a contract of who should clean the swimming pool on what days, unless, unless there's a way for the blockchain to figure out who cleaned the swimming pool on any given day, that's not never going to be something that you're going to do with Ethereum. But well, as soon as you, as soon as you do have a way of measuring that and recording that, 
then it can be done. It's just maybe not necessarily the best way of doing it. Uh, just to answer your question, definitely not only that. Um, I mean, I can, again, I'm limited to time, we can chat about it afterwards. But there are literally, I mean, there's more ideas than I, than I have the time to enumerate that have been implemented on this, but it's not fantasy. It's not going to create a vision. I think you should mention that uh, blockchains are not original. Uh, the preservation of the history of artworks, for example, and the provenance of that artwork has been going on for centuries. And it's very difficult to forge the history of a famous artwork in Monet or something like that because you've got a long list of paper going back as to who sold it, who bought it, who sold it, who bought it, and you can consult anybody on that, that chain. So it, it's better than that, it's a provenance. Blockchain is simply a provenance of the use of um, a particular amount of funds. Okay, um, okay how, many, how many minutes do I not have left? <laughs> <laughs> Fifteen minutes. Okay, all right, then I'm, I'm going to cut then because we're getting Okay, um, guys, I'm going to very quickly talk about one thing that is implemented on a blockchain, right? So there are these very cool things called prediction markets. Um, a better way of thinking about it, we've started to call them prediction markets because they've got an awesome secondary use. But the main uh, thing is actually that they event betting markets. So typically, like people betting on sport, people have been betting on all kinds of stuff. Another name for them is event derivative markets, right? So that's where somebody can list something like who will be the next president of the United States and maybe give like five potential options, right? So Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden, or other, right? Um, and people can then actually like wager on that. Um, and that market, typically how those markets work is they, uh, I'll show you a very quick example of it, is um, <clears throat> you buy shares in either Joe Biden or in Donald Trump or in... Um, uh, you know, who, whoever else the, the guys were, and, and depending on when you buy the share, the share has a different price. Any share can only really like go up to one, um, you know, and any share can only really go down to zero, right? <clears throat> and um, what's interesting about these markets, uh, they're, not, they're not really specific to blockchains. There are markets that have, like this that have existed before, um, <clears throat> specifically to our Betfair and Intrade. Um, and what's interesting about Betfair and Intrade was that, that eventually those predictions, like on things, uh, for instance, who would win a specific nomination in some Democratic caucus, right? those things started actually pulling ahead in reliability and accuracy of polling, for instance. And, and one of the main reasons for that is that with a prediction market, your incentives are incredibly well aligned. Right? So, I mean, I've got, I've got opinions, I've got like completely erroneous biases, and then I've got facts in my head. Right, now, I would not place my money where my opinions are. With one of these markets, if you wanted to actually participate and pay us a bet and that kind of thing, you need information. You need to actually know that this, this event will turn out that way. Right, so once you co-locate your, your mouth and, and your money, then um, generally the information that comes out of you is much better. Right. Um, the other thing is, like, if, if I were convinced I was true, the other interesting side effect, if I, or if I was convinced I was right, sorry, Afrikaans here the top, if I was convinced I was right, um, so in other words, I, I was betting on a bias, another interesting thing would happen. I would put my money where my mouth is and then I'd lose my money. And then guess what would happen next time? I'd have a lot less money to put where my mouth was, even if I didn't learn my lesson. And so the market over time becomes more reliable. People who are good at, um, at exposing information become richer and they continue to participate in those markets. Those who are terrible at it, you know, no longer participate and they just try and come up with some sort of an excuse. Um, there's a very interesting paper on, on prediction markets where it says like, anyone who has real information, real information, would probably participate. I mean, to not participate, if you had some money, let's say arguments like um, the example that I always use, is, let's say you were a friend of the royal couple. Right? So they have a new baby and the bets are, what is the baby going to be called? Right, so the public starts a betting market and there's like five options there and everybody is going, it will be Charles, it will be Charles. And you know them and they have a certain special relationship with the Queen and, and they want to call the child Albert because Albert had to be called King George because Albert sounded too German at the time, etc, etc. And you had that inside information. You saw that Albert's on you but it's at, at like 1%. And you said, but I'm convinced, I know for a fact that's what will happen. I'm sure if, if, the, if the actual like, gains were a hundredfold, if you could get 99 times your money back, you'd scrape together a thousand pounds and go bet on that. And the interesting thing from an economic perspective and, and, and from like a usefulness to society perspective is then what happens to that market is it now slightly edges up. 
there's now a slightly better chance. We now understand, without having to actually understand the context behind it a little bit better, what the probabilities is of this thing panning out. And what's interesting is even if you didn't have money, if you had real information, you would go borrow money. And even if you were destitute, you'd probably still have friends. And if you had real information, you'd probably be able to sell it to them somehow. So the only reason that people would not participate in these markets are either A, if they have utterly no interest in, in material wealth. Right? That's, that's one possibility. Or they are destitute and without friends. <laughs> Alternatively, they have no real information. So this will shut a lot of people up. Right. Um, what's interesting, um, all right, so, so one of the problems with prediction markets is that the state leaves prediction markets alone um, as they see the greater value and as custodians of the greater good, the state encourage their use. This is obviously not the case, right? So the state, specifically in America, has taken major steps against Bedfair and Intrade. Both of them are already located outside of the United States, but in the United States, uh, lots of the basis for laws are basically, did you do business with one of our citizens? If you did and you didn't do it in our exactly prescribed way, then you deserve to go to jail. Right, so, yeah, so, so this takes away some of the uses that we actually have for prediction markets. So the one thing is, I mean, we might want to bet for fun, right? So in other words, we might just want to bet on the outcome of some sporting event. The other interesting thing is for us as libertarians, especially on things that are incredibly important, we can actually now start placing bets, or what we could have if we actually had proper functioning prediction markets, on things like if we raise the minimum wage, will unemployment increase? And we can co-locate our money or, or money with our mouths. And we can then challenge, we can actually like start making money out of the fact that, listen, if you raise the minimum wage, people become unemployed. We can start making money off of that fact. Political parties can start playing each other off. The funders of the DA can say, listen, okay, but this is a cool way for us to at least challenge the ANC. At least say that, listen, you guys, on this policy, we bet that if we increase this axis, this axis will go in that direction. And the prediction market can resolve who was more right. And we can actually start gaining that information out of the crowd. Right. Sorry, I'm, I'm really like rushing through this stuff. I have more information on this afterwards if you want. Okay, the, the other thing is there as well is we might start using betting as a, as a form of self-defense. Like let's say there's an especially disliked politician or dangerous politician. We might do something like, and again, I don't know what the morality is of this. I'm just saying it's going to happen. There might be bets on when does this guy die which becomes strange because eventually incentives form to make him die <laughs> at a certain point in time. Right? And society can use this as sort of a balancing act to those who wield the power of the force against us, the power of the force. A force of government against us, you get what I'm saying? All right. Okay, so just a quick thing on, on, um, on prediction markets. Right, so one of the very good uses of, prediction, of, of, um, of Ethereum specifically is to implement a distributed prediction market. There's currently a project called Group Gnosis that we're actually going to use throughout our seminar. I'll show you a quick demo of it now. Um, that, uh, that we can place bets on who's going to win the best speech at this conference. Um, and what I want to show you at the end of the thing very briefly, at the end of the conference, we have like two minutes, is just how, as speeches were delivered, you know, those probabilities change as we gained information, right? Um, <clears throat> yes, and, and because of the, the nature of distributed autonomous organizations, these projects like Augur and Truthcoin can't be shut down. Um, I won't go into the governance mechanisms because we're sort of out of time, um, but basically we can now have these prediction markets. People can now bet for fun, you know, we can then actually like use this information afterwards to sort of like give the internet the capacity to not only search for facts in the present or facts in the past, but very good probabilities. Probabilities that were paid for, that were backed by money and skin in the game for how the future will turn out. All right, um, I think I've got a code there. All right, question done. Sorry, I would have made fewer slides, but I didn't have time. <laughs> Go. What's your name, Mark? Uh, Jack. Hi, Jack. Yeah, I, mean, I agree. I think the blockchain, for me, is the most revolutionary concept that could change the future of the planet in a way that many people don't yet understand. Uh, one thing I wanted to add to its applications um, is politics, where similar to what you uh, laid out there in a betting format, mm -hmm. each citizen can have, for example, a Bitcoin address. I mean, I'm, I believe Bitcoin's myself. So you get your... Uh, they do exist, I've seen them do. Sorry? They do exist, I've seen them do. Absolutely. <laughs> 
Um, so you get your encrypted uh, uh, Bitcoin address and you'll be allocated one Bitcoin or one unit and that will be a voting unit. So Jack Miller has one voting unit and this is my personal um, address or ID book. Yeah. Then you've got Donald Trump and Jacob Zuma, Helen Zillow, whatever it might be. They will have a Bitcoin address, and that will be their uh, personalized address. Mm -hmm. I will send my vote to that specific address, mm -hmm. and because the, the blockchain, everything is documented in the ledger, there's no way that that vote could somehow be uh, subverted somewhere else. Yeah. Every vote would be counted, and you can have a, a completely transparent, but at the same time, electronic voting system. And this would solve all the problems that we've seen in politics uh, today. Okay, yeah, we, we can we can get into the specifics of that example, but very good example. Voting on things, very good example. Yes, sir. Your name? Scott. Again. My name is Ayanda. Hello, Ayanda. That's from uh, prediction market. Yes. I always say, therefore, it doesn't matter how I get this information because the most advantaged person is the person with information. So if I need to murder to get the information and I get it, I can win. Sort of an insider uh, type trade. It literally, it creates um, incentives to shake information out of people. Because these prediction markets, these distributed ones like Augur, you'll have the capacity to bet anonymously or pseudonymously. Right? So, in other words, you'll be able to, let's say, on, on insider information, you will be able to trade on those markets. It will be possible. And it creates a massive incentive. I don't have a personal like ethical problem with. With, with most of what I understand of, of insider trading. Again, I'm not a stock trader either. I don't know if there really are some moral situations there. But um, but yes, exactly. It will do exactly that. It will do precisely exactly that. So you could use a silk road then to create torturous contracts to murder or torture people to get inside information. That is a real problem. It is a real problem and it's something we'll have to face in the, in the future. It is an absolute real threat. Orga includes a thing where if the people who have to, if basically the the, the the shareholders in the distributed autonomous organization of Augur, they have to report back on certain events. But in Augur, there's a mechanism built in to say that it happened, it didn't happen, or I find this unethical, I refuse to, um, to um, actually like participate. So at least they've built some sort of a measure into that type of thing, right? So in other words, that market will just never resolve, it'll just keep the liquidity. Right, um, but that type of thing, there have already been assassination markets that were bought. There was at one point something like a million rand on Ben Bernanke's head. A real million rand on Ben Bernanke's head. So it's a real problem, and it's a problem for us as a one-to-one -one society. We laugh at it as politicians because they're the low-hanging fruit. What if somebody just likes you because of your wife? Now what? We follow. We, we need to, but, but I think the, the, the thing is, I mean, society needs to feel its way around that and find positive solutions for us. Yes, sure. It, as I did last year's talk similar to this, it's worth mentioning that uh, an old boy of the South African Libertarian group, Johan Kiebers, is the CEO of an organization called Manitas.org mm -hmm. that does very much what Ethereum does. Mm -hmm. And it, it provides uh, secure contracts, secure financing, and a, a number of other services. And it's just gone live. I mm -hmm. recommend to anybody who remembers the tall, red-headed mm -hmm. uh, Johan Kevers, go and have a look at that site and take what I have to know. How do you spell that? Uh, the Mon Monitas, M-O-N-E-T-A-S, and it's uh, dot .org. Yeah, she's still got a uh, She's G-E-W-E-R-S. is G-E-V-E-R-S. No, 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 I'm not. No, no, it's not right. I'm just saying, when the time is out, just, just yeah. please stop us. Okay? Yeah, I'm not. Yes, yeah, I, I just want to extend the, the previous thought for, mm -hmm. considering we're here in Lavania, mm -hmm. um, that you could use a system like this. You could mm -hmm. set up a program with the blockchain mm -hmm. where the community members can then, can then create issues. So, do we need another school board? Do we need, uh, do we need to allocate uh, more uh, aura, more funds into irrigating a certain part of the community, whatever it might be? And each individual household can get one of these uh, Bitcoin units and they can vote on that. So you can really minimize some of the headache when it comes to getting consensus amongst the community and voting on an issue. No, you, can, you can definitely grease that thing a lot. Can somebody quickly find Yaku for us, please? Um, we just, I just want to get online and just want to quickly show you. Going to Jack, I, I think the problem you demonstrate, though, is the idea that what a majority of people think is a fact. 
Mm. Well, it, it's a fact. That's what they think, but it's not necessarily the correct and the truth. No, in other words, mm -hmm. if the majority of people think we should water that field furthest from the river, mm. it doesn't mean that is the correct fact. Mm. The correct fact is you should water the fields close to the river. Well, again, I mean, let's say, but what he's describing is he's describing a, a method of, uh, of gaining consensus amongst the community, right? What somebody else might do is you as, you as maybe the, the, the holder of information about the fact that if we irrigate that field, our income will not go up substantially. You can also use these mechanisms. You can slot like a prediction market and say, if we irrigate the field, you know, we will not have more money. If we don't irrigate the, 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 the field, we will have the same amount of money. You know, you can actually then place Two minutes, your money. We are mouth is there, or we are mine. Close. What's the same? Oh, the blue one's better. All right. Put that. There's another one. Okay, sorry guys, uh, I'm not sure we're going to get internet connectivity for me to demo this for you. I think if we if we have like a very quick two minute break in front of one of these things, um, I'll, I'll show you. I started a prediction market, like I said, for who will win the best uh, talk at our Libertarian Seminar 2015. I think currently our book clearance is, is by far ahead because I think there's only been two bets. Three bets, maybe. Uh, he's at 62 percent to win the uh, to win the best speech. Um, so, guys, what, what I'd like you to do is, I mean, obviously you have to pay in ether, so that's a little bit of a problem. But if you want to place bets, uh, we can keep it small, like 10 to 100 rand. Just like give me or Colin your bets. We'll actually like we'll just write down what it was. We'll actually go place the thing there for you, and then I want to show you at the end how our perception, how our group wisdom of what the best talk was actually changed as we gain information. Well, what's good about these markets is you can check out at any time as well. You don't have to wait for the resolution. If you bet on somebody early on and he was the favorite very close to the end, you can actually check out at that point. You know, and gain, you know, and lock in some of your winnings. And maybe then some he wins and you lose a little bit, or somebody else wins and like you actually win big because you didn't lose that amount. Okay, so yeah, if anybody's interested, guys, please, I really like, I, I want us to gain some like traction on this whole uh, prediction market thing. So you're actually uh, using yeah. a theory to do this? Yes.